It's always forgetting things. <laughs> Uh, a couple of announcements I, I want to make, and I want to call it because some of you weren't here this morning. Uh, module 2, the applications are on our website now. We've actually lowered the registration fee. We've had a donor, an anonymous donor, who felt adamant that we shouldn't be charging people to pitch. So we're taking it down to $50, and honestly, we're doing that. So your commitment is raised a little bit. Um, so we're taking from $125 down to $50. So we can thank Mr. Anonymous. Um, in Module 3, I hand it out, would love feedback on it, but they're on the same day. Module 2 is going to be in the morning. The pitching is going to be from, I think, like 9 to 12. Um, we need the application so we can put you guys into buckets. The thought is that we will sit through all of those presentations in the morning so you can watch how people are getting feedback. Question, Kevin? Question, Kevin. Okay. Um, so that's the morning of May 26. Then we're going to have lunch, which I encourage you if you're going to stay in the afternoon, if you're not, to, to purchase and eat with everybody. We're actually going to be with students that day who are doing some internship program. And then the afternoon is going to be Module 3, which is all the tactical stuff, drafts is with you with love feedback. So we'll be sending out an email if I can hear how to put stuff on that discussion board. <laughs> <laughs> now, the other thing is our discussion board. For those of you who are GSB alumni, if you're not on the uh, entrepreneur discussion board, it's actually a discussion, what do they call it now? A discussion board, they call it, it used to be called a distribution list. Um, I encourage you to do so. It's all run through the alumni office. Unfortunately, because it's run through our alumni office, there is not a way for us to put non-business school alumni on it. But we do have a way now of kind of capturing things. So if those of you who are not GSB alums are looking for <coughs> any resources or whatnot, you can give either me or Nancy call. We can either search what our, um, what's on the discussion board before we post it for you. But the question is, we, we get all kinds of things. And it's extremely active and extremely useful. Matter of fact, Bruce yesterday was adamant that we make sure everybody know about it. People are posting things for I need a lawyer, I need an attorney, what you know, what is what equity compensation do you use? What compensation do you use for operators? So it's very tactical and extremely useful. Uh, and then one other thing, and then I'll turn over to George. I can mention it with Peter in the room because I'm not too sure it's been publicly announced. But they, one thing he is working on, and Lisa and I always get nervous when we see Garth talking to Peter because it means more work is coming from him. Um, but Peter is working on taking this four week program called the Summer Institute for Entrepreneurship, which has been going out for four or five years, and, and Garth started it five years ago. Um, taking that, it's been designed for grad students from non-business school disciplines, from you know, computer science, med school, more technical fields. Um, it's been a four-week kind of summer camp in entrepreneurship. But they're trying to morph that into a certificate program, which would run January to June, one or two nights a week. It's all still in development. So just something for those of you who are not business school grads, it might be an option. They're targeting to do it in January. So. Uh, we're crossing our fingers that it's actually going to happen. So stay tuned, and as we get further into the year, you can inquire about it. Um, George Foster is going to moderate our panel. Uh, George has been teaching in entrepreneurship in varying forms for a number of years in very active research projects, which have been fun for us. He's just this year taking over Garth's teaching slot, co-teaching with Jim Ellis, the Formation and New Ventures class. Um, and certainly also noted for developing executive education programs for the NFL and the NBA. Um, which is always very fun here on campus. So, thank you, George. Okay, thanks very much. Um, okay, the topic today, uh, the formal title is Bootstrapping Friends and Family. And uh, we've got four panelists that's going to address different dimensions of that. But there's really two related topics. And I'll put up the bootstrapping first and then get to the friends and family where. And, and each of the panelists can fit into this sort of matrix how they like on this, but we'll get them to briefly describe their venture and how it uh, had aspects of either bootstrapping friends or family. So when people talk about bootstrapping, the, 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 the notion that typically comes across is financial bootstrapping. That is that you didn't have any money, you couldn't raise the funding, or uh, that you decided you didn't want to for a short while. So it, it could be that you couldn't raise it, you tried but you couldn't, but you still want to continue with the venture. Or you decide the terms that were offered were so onerous in terms of it could have been uh, equity given up or it could have been impositions in terms of restrictions on business plans or anything like that. Uh, you said, I'm not going to, I'm going to wait. I'm going to do this venture for a while till I get a certain scale and then I'm going to go out for external financing. So that's more at your choice. The other one in finance is the other party's not coming to the table. The way I think about bootstrapping, and, and I've interacted with a lot of ventures in this area, and 
and I'll talk about it in the last couple of minutes to the end of this session. I'm doing a project at the moment for the World Economic Forum where we're studying the first five to ten years of a company's existence in about eight different countries. And so I've got uh, surveys back from a whole lot of people in terms of over a hundred of these things uh, in terms of uh, China, India, Australia, uh, US, uh, Latin America, and we, we're going to issue this report in about six months. But out of that, and I've done a lot of interviews, and the notion of bootstrapping is a much broader one. And so you'll see some people in actually think of bootstrapping as people, that they, they hold back hiring people till they absolutely need the person. And it could be because of their labor regulations in certain countries, it's so bad to lay people off, they err on the side of hiring people on, on right at the last moment. So Germany, France are classic examples of that. The other end of the spectrum is India and China, where there appears to be a relatively easy layoff policy. So they, they'll scale up and scale down very quickly on that. But you can be people constrained by choice, even if you're not funding constrained. Customers, in terms of bootstrapping, is where you sort of find your way with a couple of customers, but you don't want to open it up for a large search. And it could be that the customers themselves are attracted to you, but the terms that they want to deal with you, you can't have the capacity to do at the moment. So I've seen several companies go into something like an REI, uh, or it could be a Walmart, and Andre could talk a little bit about this, where they may have requirements that if in fact it's a successful, there are 2,000 Walmarts and we want you in two or three months to get into the Walmart infrastructure and roll it out. And you just don't have the pieces together, so you wait on that. Um, partners is the same thing. Infrastructure is a broader term. It could be infrastructure intellectually within the, in the company. You, you hold back, bringing in a whole lot of other people in terms of ideas. It could be just the physical infrastructure that you're dealing with, or it could be supply chain infrastructure. And the last one is a very important one when we get the friends and family support mechanisms. Who do you rely on in terms of when times are tough? Both good advice and bad advice. I mean, if times are tough, you're speaking advice. It's not bad advice. Bad times, the advice in bad times, and the support in bad times, and also strategizing in good terms. So if I think I can see startups that actually have constraints in all of these areas. Okay? And that's typically a lot of the startups. If they have high growth aspirations, they still could be constrained. The other end of the spectrum where I've seen startups, corporate startups, where there's sort of no constraints. They say there's this huge market opportunity, and the CEO says, we want to have a new line of business, go after it. And the money's there, the people's there, the infrastructure. The only question is, can they get a sizable scale with the market on that? Typically, what you'll find is that there'll be some combination of these constraints in terms of bootstrapping. And over time, the challenge is to relax these sort of constraints. Now, just in terms of the other topic is that if I think in terms of friends and family, you can, they can relate to any one of these six areas. On the, and the friends can come in several dimensions. One is, they could be childhood friends. So you're starting up a venture, and we had uh, one of the cases we teach is uh, a fellow had a, uh, it's a piece of exercise equipment, and he had a friend he had from childhood days. And he brought him on the venture, and uh, they, that was an ex-friendship now. Mm -hmm. okay? It didn't have a, a pretty ending on that. But, but that was a person who came in, he thought that he, that person would be great, and I think sometimes on this, you try to help your friends. So sometimes I've run ventures for the, uh, I remember one we ran one for the NBA players. And I was having a guest speaker, and one of the guest speakers is a really high profile Hall of Fame player. And he brought in, he said to me, the night, called me the night before, he said, do you mind if I bring along a friend? And I said, you can bring any friend you like, <laughs> whatever. And so this other guy came in, he was also a Hall of Fame player. And he wanted to involve him in the adventure, but the guy was, he said, my friend's lost. He doesn't know what to do with his life. I want to help him out. 
Now, whether helping him out in a venture that you're starting up is a useful thing to do is a, a serious question mark. But it was a genuine thing. This guy flew his friend up from Los Angeles to get in front of these I mean, high-profile players to just to sp get a spark in and say, look, get back in the game. Not the, the football game, but get back in the game of life. And it was a wonderful gesture, but I kept on thinking, and I told the, the guy, asked him, I said, there are many ways to help him, but in a venture, you don't necessarily want to do that. Uh, there's a risk to it. And, and he, he, in the end, he decided it wasn't worth the risk. Um, college friends, obviously, Stanford's a wonderful place. That, that when we're recruiting, whether it's uh, undergrads or grads, we say four years for 40 years is, is the tagline that we use in recruiting. I just did recruiting for undergrads for the football team. Uh, these are high school kids. And that's the tagline we use, four years for 40. Okay, and so the relationships you form at Stanford, you live for a long, long time on that. The business school is absolutely wonderful on that. Uh, you have any number of professional friends that you see in the jobs that you have, the associations that you join. So, for instance, people join an organization called TIE, which is the Indian Entrepreneurs Group in the Bay Area. And now it's a global. That's a wonderful source for, for networking and those type of things. And then you've got your family, and the family can define in a very narrow sense, or it can be defined in a broader sense. So each of those you can tap into. So what I'm going to do, we'll start with Gary, just briefly describe his venture and, and a little bit of his journey. So take five minutes each, and then talk a little bit of how you see either the bootstrapping or the friends of the family. Sure. Thanks, Gary. Okay, great. So, um, uh, my name is Gary Alpert. I'm a uh, 1993 uh, graduate of GSB, Linda's class, Jim Ellis' <laughs> class. Um, we're starting to feel like kind of, you know, uncomfortably senior. <laughs> I don't think of myself that way until I come back to the GSB. But um, in any case, um, uh, the company... Don't worry about it. <laughs> Um, the company that I'm going to talk about is actually a different one than is in my bio, but I started a, um, a company uh, out of the GSB with a classmate of mine um, called, um, at the time it was called Wet Feet um, uh, Partners. We became Wet Feet Press, mm -hmm. wetfeet.com. Um, had lots of iterations over the years. Um, and um, uh, the experience that we had is actually, um, I, you know, getting back to the um, uh, comments that George made about uh, bootstrapping. Um, we didn't bootstrap because we couldn't go out and raise money. Um, Steve and I bootstrapped because after spending two years at the GSB, the one thing that we knew was that we did not want to raise money. We did not want to be owned by somebody else as we were just getting started. So we actually um, put that, put that as, a, as a constraint and a filter on starting a company together. Um, we, we decided that um, the first test of our ability to work together as partners and to build a business was to see if we could um, actually stay together um, and get something going without relying on other people's money to do it. And this wasn't because we were, a, we were in a position to contribute our own financial resources. In fact, both of us had um, you know, debt to pay off when we came out of the GSB. So, um, so we just decided this was a good test and if we're still working together after six months, then actually the chances of us being able to build a business and work together over years um, are probably enhanced and will be a more attractive um, uh, investment by somebody down the road if that's where this journey takes us. Um, ultimately, over the, about 14 years of um, running the company, um, we, we did end up, um, we bootstrapped for about a year and a half. We brought in a, uh, angel investors, um, kind of friends and family type of angel investors. And then we um, ultimately raised about $20 million of venture capital and then um, uh, ended up selling the business uh, ultimately. So went through all different phases. But um, you know, I guess the one piece of advice that um, um, you know, I would give around bootstrapping is I did think that on the filter side, it was, um, for us at least, a fantastic experience. Um, when we started our business, neither one of us had done that before. So we needed, and, and we, did, we decided to do this as a team. We were friends at the GSB. We were breaking a lot of the rules that we had learned in small business entrepreneurship. Don't start a company with a friend. You know, all the different kinds of things that are the no's. Yet we felt that, that our friendship um, could actually enhance our ability to work together, but we needed to test whether or not we could make decisions, whether we could divide and conquer the right way, whether we could actually build a product, whether customers would buy our product. Um, the way that we financed our business early on, um, bootstrapping for us, in the very early days 
meant getting other jobs while we were getting this company going. Um, we um, consulted, we worked very closely. We, we actually, I don't think either one of us spent a whole lot of time at the Career Center while we were students, but after we were students, we were the best friends of the Career Center, and they were so amazingly helpful um, in um, sending um, consulting projects our way. Um, they really kept us going, in fact, um, to the point where eventually we had to cut it off um, because we weren't spending enough time on our business. Um, we also relied extremely heavily for our business on our classmates. Um, although, again, we uh, decided not to go out and raise money initially, we um, absolutely leveraged the resources that we had um, from our own um, GSP classmates, faculty, and everything else. Um, you know, we have um, uh, uh, classmates here today, but um, there wasn't anybody in our class who didn't hear from Steve and I um, as far as actually being able to help us build our product. And um, that, again, allowed us, without raising any external funding, to make tremendous progress in a very short period of time. So, Alyssa? Well, thanks. Um, my name is Alyssa Rapp. I'm class of 05, founder and CEO of Bottlenotes, which also has gone through many machinations, although a shorter life cycle so far. It's been five years. Started as a niche e-commerce play, and I felt comfortable bootstrapping it because uh, even though it was an e-commerce play, we had zero inventory carrying costs in light of a partnership with a warehouse up in Napa that I discovered in my entrepreneurship class here with Jin Wang. And uh, it was with no, with no CapEx and inventory carrying costs, if I could raise less than a million from friends and family, I figured I could put up a website, go-go years of 2005, not quite 99, but still pretty good, uh, do something unique and interesting in this space, deliver wine tailored to people's personal tastes using patent pending matching technology, all the cap, you know, all the all the capital raised would be people and technology. Quick win, two years out, double, triple people's money. If it was all friends and family, they'd be happy with that, and on to the next. And the exciting thing is, is that I was sitting on a much more interesting opportunity than I realized. Uh, the challenging thing is, is that I I think I am the poster child for undercapitalization, and I would do it very differently the next time. Uh, but. The, the punchline is that we ended up shifting strategies very dramatically in about 18 months ago from a niche e-commerce play to a media play. And so Bottlenotes today, Bottlenotes was always a, always a wine marketing firm, but instead of monetizing the wine marketing services we provide for our winery and importer partners and now other luxury brands, creating direct-to-consumer brand awareness in that value chain, instead of capturing cash or economic value from the consumers, I've, in the last 18 months of inverted the model and really where we are now is still a wine marketing firm with four main consumer touch points, bottlenotes.com, a website which still has e-commerce but it's in the back burner, it's more or less a community platform. The Daily Sip, which I don't know how much you all are familiar with, Daily Candy or Thrillist or Urban Daddy, but now is being thought of as the Daily Candy for wine. Um, the third platform are Around the World and 80 Sips events, which are large scale trade show style events and with the same advertisers that advertise in the Daily Sip and then we're launching a mobile platform in June. So the good news is, with angel investors who were friends and family initially, and even if they weren't <coughs> friends before they became angel investors as the journey, even if they weren't friends initially, they've become friends as the journey has gone on. Uh, the challenging thing is when I turned bottle notes from an e-commerce play to a media play, which if I had started with that would have been very easy for venture financing, and I have no NPS, I have many classmates who I love and adore, who are venture capitalists that I ever said if I were going for a venture play, of course, we would, you know, we've had the conversations, we do business together, but it's a different deal to start with one idea, completely reinvent it, and if you're starting with something with then, with revenue, with some ability to cover some or most of your burn, and now you wanted to make a strategic shift, the great news with friends and family is that they're not VCs and they're not going to fire you and out you go, or hamstring you theoretically for making that strategic shift. Um, the bad news is, is that if, it, if you're not properly capitalized with a strategic partner venture or otherwise, and you find yourself in an interesting situation, even if it's pure cash flow management, let alone actual, actually needing more money to, for the operations of the business, it, you don't have any one person to turn to. If you have a diffused capital base of 20 people who love you, who've all written 100 to $150,000 checks, which is what I have. And, and, and more than that, even the average unit's even higher. So in some ways, they're not traditional friends and family or even angels. It's still a challenge. So I think that from my perspective, boots, I, I mean, I have the bootstrapping story on every single dimension that George was mentioning before. But you know, the good new, in terms of close friends um, or childhood or college, I've not taken any of their money. People have offered, haven't gone there, don't want to go there. In terms of family members, 
have taken some, not others, uh, have taken more of some than they would have wanted, and, and, <laughs> and not others. Um, in terms of significant other, haven't. Try to keep that church and state pretty clear. In terms of um, one degree removed of friends and childhood friends and collegiate friends or GSB friends, I have absolutely, and I've always found that my existing investor base has been the, be have been the best brand emissaries for the next set of investors. So what bootstrapping means to me is not only not taking venture money, but also I had a unique situation in the first, when I first started. One of, one, of the classmate, one of my classmates' fathers for whom I had worked decided to seed bottle notes, and he gave me the verbal that he would do it before I graduated, and he said, get, you know, the, essentially the prototype, the basics going, and then I'll write the check. And he absolutely kept his work, P.S., but what happened was that I wrote a couple much larger checks than I would have if I had understood that that would have meant um, it wasn't coming out ever. Um, well, come out, of course, when there's an exit. But, but what that meant was that what, I, what you also find with high nets, I think, um, more than others, is that they don't, it's not the same push and pull with venture. When you write a check, whether you're an individual who's the founder of the company or anyone else, you're all in this thing together. So money in is in. It's just in. And, and the other side of it is that once you're an equity investor in your own company, different from your common stock but preferred shares, you know, if there's a capital call and everyone, you too have to write the check in addition to everything else. So that's also a different dynamic that I would also do differently. I think, so what has happened is that I've, been, I've put money in at different points throughout the life cycle of the business alongside other investors and I still don't want venture capitalists. In fact, I begrudgingly accepted one small family fund which calls themselves a VC last year and they are the only investor that's made in my life to, difficult since I started this company. So I think my way of doing it in the future would either bootstrap it personally if I could, all the way to the point that I could, I mean like through a couple of years, and then partner up with a venture firm, or take the big slug of cash from the right venture partner early on, so you know they're in the trenches with you later in the game, uh, and, then, and then when you have, if and when you need to increase your working capital, you've got that person who's literally whose career is tied to your success as much as your own versus a family member who writes a fifty, hundred, hundred fifty thousand dollar check and you know the good news is when they write it, hopefully anyone who writes you a check as an angel investor would never do it if we're gonna change their lifestyle. On the other hand, and every time you see them at the holidays you're thinking about it. Even if they've written it off. Even if they've even not written off the investment, even if they're not thinking about it. Every time you go out to dinner, every time that you know they ask you about the business, all of a sudden you're back in a you know, selling it. No, I'm serious. And that, and these things, you know, and I, and we, and I don't want to take up too much time, but, you know, I think that there are valuable reasons in spite of resource constraints, even if there aren't any resource constraints, to test the people on your team to see if they're willing, as an entrepreneur at least, if they're willing to put in a month or two of ramp up work while you're, consi while you're doing the dance to, you know, consider being hired, if they're really willing to dig in and invest time without being paid. I think there are good ways to test their loyalty. And I know a lot more about you know testing people's real stomach for the entrepreneurial ride. I think it's really smart when you're resource constrained to pick one or two or three or five key partners or customers and make sure you get that right you know in scaling. Um, but I think that it is very tricky to mix and match that on the on the support mechanism side that George was mentioning. I think it is tricky to mix um, mix personal relationships with money, even if it's not tricky for the people investing. And so I I don't regret any of the decisions I've made. We're, having, we're in strategic conversations with some really exciting people right now, so I, I feel confident of, about how far we've come, but you know, if I could do it all over again, I don't know if I would do it the hand-to-hand -hand combat bootstrap model. Just, just one question. You raise, suppose you raise a million dollars from a VC. Uh, they may do that in states, so they may give you the first 200, the second 200 later, and it could be even milestone. Uh, when you do it for friends and family, ten of a hundred thousand, you get the hundred thousand from the. F you typically wouldn't do it staged from the family. Each one gives you a hundred thousand right from the start, isn't it? Yeah, and the only people who've done tranches for me are people who've invested. There are two individuals who've invested over half a million each as individuals, which again is getting up to be the. You know, they've done it at two different two fifty slugs, but you know, typically an angel writes it, is done with it, yeah. and that's the good news. The bad news is, is that when they write it and they're done with it, they don't expect you to come back again. So it's a very, very, very different dynamic in terms of uh, keeping up to date. I mean, ideally, you should keep up to date with your investors, but if somebody's on the line for tranches with you, and there's a premium on really sort of listening to what milestones that they have and sort of playing their game as well as what you're trying to do. 
Uh, Andre, uh, Andre's got a fascinating story in terms of this is leveraging two to the max is, is uh, one way I can call it. Is that a fair comment, Andre? I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> 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 um, Andre Woodery, uh, class of 06, uh, founder and CEO of Magma Grip. Um, Magma Grip is a San Francisco-based uh, tool company. We make um, uh, tool storage gear, and what's unique about our product line is it's, uh, it incorporates magnets, um, uh, so it provides, uh, you know, uh, more storage capacity. It's, it's, a, it's basically a little bit better widget than what's on the market. Um, <coughs> uh, so, um, you know, when I started this journey, so I'm kind of go back to, uh, I started a business while I was in B school, um, actually between first and second year. At the time, I was sort of hungry, looking for the next venture to get into. Um, my previous uh, experience was in the restaurant business, um, and also, um, you know, in, in technology. I spent a couple of years at IBM as a software engineer. Um, so I've I've always sort of jumped into something, you know, without prior experience. And so with this business, it was uh, no different. Um, <clears throat> I think for me, um, so I was very hungry, um, you know, the first product was a, a magnetic wristband. At the time, all I had on the table was, was basically an innovative product. I, I didn't really have, you know, looking back in, in hindsight, I didn't really have the, the, un, the opinions for a company. Uh, but, you know, luckily I was naive enough to not really look that far ahead. Um, I was just super excited. Um, I, I saw an opportunity in the marketplace and I, um, I basically, you know, said, you know, there's no reason why this product should not be in, a, in Home Depot. Uh, so, sort of my, the process, um, sort of my mindset when I started was, was basically, you know, make a little, sell a little. You know, fortunately for my type of business, um, you don't have to um, tie up a lot of capital. The, the, our initial product was, you know, it's a very, it's a low cost product that costs, you know, it, it costs a few bucks to make, um, and um, you know you can, um, and it, it's not, it, it's not mind-boggling technology. So it's <laughs> very, very, you know, you know, I could probably, you know, I could probably, you, yeah. So, so, so that that made it, it made it bootstrap friendly from that standpoint. Um, and sort of my mindset was, you know. Um, at the time, I had question marks about whether I could really sell a product. You know, do I have the sales, the sales skills? So the challenge I put to myself was, you know, let me make a thousand of these, and if I can sell a thousand of these widgets, then um, I should be able to sell a thousand sports watches. And if I can sell a thousand sports watches, I should be able to sell a million, um, and, and so, <coughs> you know, a million sneakers or what have you. So that was sort of my mindset um, <coughs> going into it. Um, started a business with um, five thousand dollars of my own uh, personal cash, and then forty thousand dollars that I raised from uh, friends and families. Uh, two uh, were classmates from the GSB, and uh, the other two investors were uh, buddies of mine that <coughs> invested in uh, the restaurant business that I had done uh, before B school. Um, and uh, basically, you know, I worked for two years without taking a salary. Um, I, I had, fortunately, I had some cash um, reserves built up from before B school, so that was basically what I did. You know, I, I didn't want to put any added constraint on the business beyond, you know, beyond sort of, um, you know, be, be, beyond sort of the, the other sort of things that you have to, to worry about. Um, and so I basically, you know, the reserves I had was enough to carry me for two years and then unfortunately at that point we had grown the business to a point where it could support a salary for myself and then I eventually added a second person um, and we're still now just a two-man uh, company. Um, so it's, it's um, <coughs> it, to date in terms of capital that we've, we've brought in, it's about uh, 400000 in total. We've been in operation for five years. Um, it's still the, s the core group of investors. We've actually added two new investors that came in. Um, and um, those investors contributed services more so than capital. So, um, you know, we just tried to be very creative in, in sort of how, um, 
we, we finance and sort of grow the business. Um, in terms of, um, you know, my sort of, I take sort of a philo <coughs> philosophical approach to, to, this, to this journey. Um, I don't think about the dollars and cents on a day-to-day -day basis. Sort of my milestones are like, can we get, you know, can we get from one product to, to, to um, 10 products? And then can we get these products in Home Depot? Can we get it in Walmart? Can we get it in overseas into Europe? And it's, that's sort of the way I've approached the business. And I think because I have that approach, um, <clears throat> I'm not in a hurry to get rich. It's sort of get rich slowly or build a, build a business slowly. I've been fortunate to have patient capital and also knowledgeable capital that's, <clears throat> that's back in the company. And so I think um, if you're going to go the bootstrapping route and if you're going to take money from angels or whoever, it's like a marriage, <clears throat> you want to make sure, <clears throat> excuse me, you want to make sure that that person or, you know, is, um, is, is sort of in it for the long, in it for the long run and, and, um, and, and will be patient and allow the, the business to, to slowly find its footing. And so we've been fortunate to, um, to have that type of capital support in the business. Um, we're in a stage now where we're, we're kind of like at this inflection point. Uh, we recently got into Home Depot. Um, we, we're going to be um, live on Walmart.com in about a month. Um, we got into uh, Canadian Tire, they're like a Home Depot, big player in Canada, and uh, we're in discussions with, uh, with Lowe's, um, and, and uh, it looks like that something is going to happen. We're, we're sort of in final uh, negotiations with them. So it, we're sort of in the stage now where, <coughs> I, I call it the honeymoon period, it's sort of like we're fresh and exciting, you know, and, and everyone wants to, uh, you know, and so... I'm I'm trying to, you know, keep my foot on the gas pedal and, and just try to, to to grow the business as much as, as possible while we're in this honeymoon phase. And so we're in a stage now where we are looking to bring in additional funds to grow the business. Um, mostly debt financing, that's that's what we're you know, we're not really and and I'm in a position where you know we st I still definitely don't want to take uh, VC. I don't think our business is a VC type business anyway. It, it, it's, it's, um, <clears throat> but in terms of angels that we look at, um, you know, we know that we can go back to our existing investor base. Uh, but in terms of new and you know new angels that we're looking at, I'm very weary about you know, you know, is this a person? Is, you know. You know, do I want to get in bed? You know, do I, you know, with, with with this group? And that's my biggest. You know, I know I can get the money. It's just sort of like, who am I partnering with? Because I've been fortunate to have patient capital, and I want to kind of keep that type of uh, investor base going forward. Um, the last thing I'll say, and, and then I'll sort of hand it off. Um, the um, I think I lost my train of thought here. Um, it, it'll come back out. <laughs> so Jessica, is, is, this is what you call uh, the fast growth story. Is that a fair comment, Jessica? It's, I always say it's the overnight success story that took seven years. Oh, it okay. sounds like one. Seven years but, yeah. is a very short time frame for what you achieve. Uh, well, I, so I, um, I was, was thinking when I see George, I always remember a moment where you caught me, asked me, like cold called me in the year cost accounting class when I was working on my business plan, like underneath <laughs> the table back there. <laughs> but I started... Uh, my first company, WeddingChannel.com, out of uh, the GSB of Class of 99, left after my first year because it got funded by Kleiner Perkins, and that was definitely the heyday of overcapitalization. And so I think having done a uh, business, and now the, the Wedding Channel is part of the knot, and it was a successful venture and still in existence today, but that was a business that was extremely capitalized during the height of venture, and... Um, and, it, and I think a lot of what Andre said is, you know, financing to me isn't is about, well, what is your, how much capital do you need to get the business to success? That was a business that required, it required an intense amount of capital because of the infrastructure that we had to lay down with IT systems, because the type of partners that we were going to have were billion dollar retailers. They needed to see that kind of credibility and capital in the company. So there was no bootstrap option for that concept. Um, also, where I was in my life at that point, I was, you know, a 24-year-old entrepreneur. I knew that I needed 
the credibility, wisdom, and recruiting network of a venture route. So for me at that point, like I, I didn't consider bootstrapping. It wasn't an option for the concept. Uh, but having gone through that experience, uh, when I wanted to do my next venture, uh, I very much knew that I was not going to go the venture route for, for several reasons. And I, and I, in fact, almost worked backwards into the business idea, having one of my filters be the criteria being organic growth and something that I could sort of fund and control for the long run. And that was primarily for me a lifestyle uh, decision. And my husband and my investor today, which my bootstrapping you know, partners, which I'll talk about, are, still make fun of me because I would say, like, this is kind of a lifestyle business because at that point I think I was, you know, 29 and sort of the slow, 30, the, the slow growth of Stella and Dot, which is my company, um, is that I had a couple kids in, in that, during that time. So the last thing I knew I could do was, you know, roll in and be like, I'm about to start this company and I'm pregnant and right after that I'm going to have another kid and I didn't want to be on that 80 hour a week grind that I had been on my channel and I am very much on now. So my timeline was that I was waiting until like my second child was six months old before I really put on the foot on the gas. So it was very much a lifestyle thing that I needed to keep control of this but um, I still couldn't stop the entrepreneur in me from wanting to start another business. You know, anyway. But um, so Stella and Dot is a um, is a social shopping company. It's basically a modern day version of Mary Kay. It's a home-based business platform for the modern woman that sells boutique style jewelry and accessories um, through in-home trunk shows, a person-to-person, -person, through social media marketing and online. And it grew from, you know, when I really started in, I think we, I took my first seed capital um, in 2005. And that was from Doug McKenzie, who was my initial investing partner at Kleiner. But since then, he had formed his own sort of Berkshire Hathaway-esque fund that was, you know, is private money, so there's no other LP with a liquidity timeline and preference um, and criteria. Uh, and so I went to him and, and did very much a non-VC deal saying, like, I'm going to do something here. It's going to be big. I'm committing to no timeline, no business plan, no preference, <laughs> not, none of that other stuff. You know, are you in? And like, luckily, we had the business relationship where he was like, okay, you know, and for that, and of course, it was a very small amount of capital, so it was 250K. So it, it was like, sure, let's see where this goes. And, you know, and again, I spent a couple years just, just trying to figure out the experiment for this business. So the business stayed at like a million dollars, three million dollars, and 33, and now on pace to do over 100. Um, and throughout that time, we've only, we've had to, or more capital in the business, um, but it's so it's not totally business bootstrap for the first few years. Now there's maybe four million total in, but the, the operators in the business are also the capital contributors. And the, and the thing for me was I didn't want to get anyone in who wanted their money out anytime soon. I have zero as a, the CEO. I have an, an owner of the company. I have zero interest in taking the company public. You know, when people ask me about and what like what is our financing strategy? Our financing strategy is sales and margin. Like I had such a, from doing companies in the 99 vintage, I just had such a distaste for the concept of like, you know, not everything's a loss leader. Like at some point you need to make money and that's what should grow, fund the growth of the business. So we have a line of credit that we don't use just because you should, but I, I just personally want to grow the business off of sales and profits. Um, and so now we're in a very good cash position and the company's very profitable, but it was with a lot of patience and with knowing that you are, you know, when you start a company, it is your life. Like, it is your blood, sweat, and tears, and soul. And when you bring in a financial partner, that, you, it's like marrying them. It is like having children with someone. Like, you are in bed with this person. And so you better like them and have the same values. And so, and for me, you know, we're a very mission-driven company. It is, you know, our mission is to be the next billion-dollar brand that changes the, you know, that positively impacts the lives of women around the world, and I needed a mission-driven partner which wasn't someone was like, I want to flip it in five years, or I'm looking for this type of return. It was like, we're doing this together. We're doing these for the right reasons. It's not about the quarter. It's not about the year. It's about what are we building as a brand, as an offering, as an infrastructure. So, so I, I, bootstrapping was, you know, I wanted control. I wanted it for the right reason, because I want to be, you know, just so it made a lot of sense. So what that took in the meantime, though, was, um, I didn't pay my, I, we, I forewent salary for years and didn't pay myself for the first, I think, three years of the business. Um, my dad, who is a brilliant uh, engineer and software developer, 
actually like in his retirement, you know, he's in his 70s, my poor dad's like working away, building our computer <laughs> systems, and he, but he's now, he, and I gave him equity for it, and he's now very happy about that, but, um, but he, you know, that's bootstrapping, is like, you know, having your dad at Thanksgiving being like, where's the code, you know, where's the release, and, and it's, it is, and, and basically choosing to keep it small, and there's a lot of downside with, with bootstrapping in the sense that you are, you know, when, when we started Wedding Channel, we went with big budgets, and you know, everyone I, I kind of joke like, you never learn to be a manager when everyone that works for you is like a Stanford GS, you know, be a GSB or HBS person. Like everyone's driven, everyone's motivated, everybody knows what they're doing. When you're bootstrapping and you don't, both on an equity and cash side, don't want to you know give it all away. You are choosing to not hire a super caliber person in this role. You're going to do what you can afford to teach it. You're choosing not to go out with the love mark branding that you would do, or not invest in a system that you know you're going to throw away in a year. It, it's just, to me, I think bootstrapping is always thinking about like signing a, a lease on an office. It's like, like, that is an analogy for everything you do, with people, with technology, with marketing, with all that stuff. It's like, you really, today, you're only going to buy this small space, or sign a lease, short-term lease for a small space, and you know you're moving every nine months, or every 12 months. But that takes a lot of churn. You know, it, it takes a lot of turning it over again and recalibrating even the culture of the company. Because what, when we're, we're, you know, cutting corners on purpose, you know, 12 months ago, you're like, we don't, that's not who we are today. Like, we're, yes, we're going through the full branding exercise. And yes, we're hiring a search firm to get a real CTO. And yes, we're doing this because you're no longer in that bootstrapping phase. And that is turning the ship to get, to, to do that. So, um... I, I've never, uh, and I have a, with my investor, who is, 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 is a friend and is, you know, also has, the, the, you know, professional investment background, is very, you know, it, and I say this with love, like very snobby on who else can sit at the table. And for good reason, right? Because you can, you do not want to take capital from just anybody. Because it's, I, I sort of loathe the financing process because I feel like every ounce of time you spend on raising money is you're not operating the business. You're not generating sales and revenue. You know, if you're not generating sales <laughs> or gotten costs, you're really not running the business, right? And, and, and financing to me is like that annoying thing we've got to deal with. And if those people are not, you know, in it for, with you for the right reasons, with the right exit strategy, for all those other things, you know, it, it can be really disruptive. So um, I feel like very fortunate to have done it one way enough to know that I wanted it to do it, to, to do it the other. And you do have to be in a point where you can say, okay, you know, I don't need current comp to pay the mortgage. So luckily, you know, my husband's working, and we, you know, and that 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 is, you know, bootstrapping can be incredibly stressful if that was what was putting food on the table. So, you know, I would not recommend it if that was if that was the situation you were in. Thanks, Jessica. As you say, incredibly diverse uh, stories on that. So let's sort of, I, I think, just the interest rather than me make comments. Why don't we just open up for questions on that, and then we can sort of do it around. Jim? Yeah, I, Jessica, I think this one might be for you. You know, when you ended up going to Doug for this new one, you said, hey, $250,000, are you in? Was not his question, well, what do I get for it? You know, kind of the evaluation. I'm looking for a pre-money valuation that you're going to, as opposed to you get certain percent, and here's what I need to do it. Um, we definitely talked about, you know, the, the thing is, is that the valuation is sort of like a market rate for you know, it's like four million three. You know, it's like there's no for when you when it's just small and nothing, and you're basically backing a horse, which is like, it, you know, and that's sort of what how they looked at it. And you know, this, the second bootstrapping person was the other guy, a Kleiner, who I worked with. It was almost like getting the band back together. And I think that is a little bit. It's 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 good to be a second time entrepreneur because then there's people who are like, whatever, you know, it might not work out, but all the, it's all they're doing is betting anyway. And so they're just sort of betting on people. And the valuation is like, I'm not going to nickel and dime him. He's not going to nickel and dime me. That's just sort of a going rate for an idea. But, but even if you don't have a win under your belt, I did find that it, I've seen both kinds of angels. And it's a very clean thing if you're starting with an idea. You know, my seat was not, not the same gentleman, Doug McKenzie, but you know, a, a very high net, ultra high net worth individual from the East Coast. And it's basically, the, especially in the very beginning, they're absolutely betting on you as a human being. And if you don't want to have the valuation conversation, which is frankly premature anyway at that point when it's a piece of paper idea and you the horse, 
Then convertible note's a wonderful vehicle, and it's a way for them to invest without being tied to valuation, where you get them deal sweeteners because they're that early money. The only risk is if you never do an equity financing, then you're outgoing them the money because it's a promissory note if there aren't other triggers to convert it. But I have found, and a dear friend of mine who's also at GSB along with Kirk Hawkins with Icon Aircraft, heavily GSB uh, um, discussed and taught um, company, you know, he and I have had this conversation numerous times. Convertible notes are the best kept secret in the financing world because you avoid, I mean, while it is always distracting and detracting, and I agree with Jessica completely there, you know, if you can get your earliest folks in at, at a note, even I've done notes three different times in the company's evolution because you're basically punting on a difficult valuation conversation, which is, and it's, they're also very, very easy to do. Unanimous board consent, majority of stockholders, and out it goes. So, you know, I, I think that that's a way to avoid that conversation. So just describe briefly how it avoids the valuation. So, you so a convertible note, the way it works is that it's a it's, it's debt tool. Um, and what you do is you put in deal sweeteners such as interest. Um, and you, you know, it's usually market rate plus five points given <coughs> so it's risk adjusted. And then the deal sweeteners can either be a discount, flat discount on equity upon equity conversion or warrant coverage, either of which provides the investor with additional equity above and beyond the cash that's being invested. And so, it is upon equity conversion. So if you do already have a financing round underway, you already have some equity shareholders, it will be tied to, if you never, you know, if, if things go really south, which, you know, ideally they would never, but if they did, it would convert into the last round. So then you'd get really hosed as a, as a common stockholder um, or even an earlier preferred shareholder. However, if it's before any equity financing has been done, like in the very, very beginning early stages, then it's just going to be tied to the an equity financing at some later stage of valuation, which has never been set. Right. And so you, you've totally avoided the valuation conversation. But you, you may have a, the, you come in at say 70% of the, the next round financing or something like that. And that's, everything's negotiable, but that's one of us is saying you avoid the actual putting a number on something that at this stage is. You get a 30% discount, but on what is what's to be yeah, determined. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. yeah. You know? Can you talk a little bit about, in the initial stages, how did you go about estimating how much money to raise and how long did you expect it to last? And what were the main consumers of cash at that stage? Why don't we take it down? Gary, why don't you start? You've done two, at least. Sure, yeah. So, um, I, you know, and the, the company that I'm um, at now carrying, um, you know, it was more of a company that was a venture-backed, you know, business from the beginning. Um, uh, you know, we, um, as I mentioned, you know, the, the first phase was um, no external funding. So it was fund the business through sales. That was really the first bar. And that really forced us to make a lot of hard decisions, which at the time felt like very easy decisions because if we were not using other people's money to fund the business, then of course we were not going to pay ourselves salaries. We were not going to spend extra money on anything, we were going to you know, do everything absolutely at the bare bones level and see if we could still produce a product that people would buy. It wasn't until we actually had sales, of, and it, it also forces a decision about the product, so you're not going to try to build a be-all, end-all product. You're going to build something that you can get out the door, you can ship it, and you know that it is not um, necessarily ready for prime time, but if people are willing to buy that, then you know, that's a, a pretty good signal that maybe there's something there um, long term. So. That was really the call um, that we made. And then when we um, did bring in our first round, it was um, this kind of angel investor, friends and family. We turned back again to our network, um, Joel Peterson, who was a professor of both of ours at the GSB, um, although we took a real estate class from him. So it wasn't, he wasn't the obvious investor in a publishing business, but it ended up that, um, I mean, we just thought he was a super smart guy and talked to him about the business. He said, oh yeah, by the way, I." gave your product to my daughter, she loved it, and she told me I need to invest in your business. So, you know, let's let's have a conversation about that. So that was kind of how that was how it worked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, um, so uh, our expectations too at that stage were small because guess what? We had we had been running the business, you know, bare bones. And so, you know, for us at that time we raised um, uh, from the angels about 250,000. That seems to be kind of a magic number. And you know, that was all the money in the world to us. We never in our wildest dreams, you know, dream, really dreamed of having that much money to work with. And the first um, uh, thing that we did is we hired a um, uh, uh, operations kind of customer service uh, person 
so that um, we could actually sell that. And her job was to take orders. You are the order taker. You take the orders. You get the orders processed. You make. You know, we, we were kind of building things real time at that point. You get it out the door. You handle all those issues so that Steve and I could also be building and, and, and that. So that was that was the stage. And then it, it really it wasn't until a few years later um, when we had you know more significant revenue coming in and the opportunity to have discussions about the directions to take the business that you know we decided to kind of take a venture <laughs> path and at that point we we're talking bigger dollars and a whole different kind of experience. But again, I think the first phase is good test is to you think about what can I do with no capital. Um, because I, I think that, again, absolutely right, there are some businesses that's not going to work. Um, but it also may allow you to reframe the idea or what you think it's going to take and test your commitment to, am I really ready to invest my life in this particular business? And if you're not, better to learn it then than it is to learn it when you're <coughs> taking someone's money. You're a classic one in terms of delaying as much as possible. Yeah, so I mean, I, you know, for me, there's a couple things. You know, I always wanted to maintain control. Um, you know, I've heard all the, the scary stories of, you know, an investor comes in and, you know, the see, you know, they, they're trying to rush, you know, they're just trying to control things and you're not able to sort of build. It, it's not fun anymore. Um, but it, it, to, to kind of answer your question, I think the way to think about it is, is <coughs> You know, look at sort of the milestones. Like, what is the first thing that I need to get accomplished? Um, and <clears throat> the way to think about it, each milestone that you're able to accomplish, uh, whether it's building a prototype, then the building a the product, and, and then, you know, getting your first few customers. Um, as you go along that path, your business becomes more and more valuable. So if you can delay <clears throat> giving up equity, you know, until you've had a, the product built or a prototype, you're going to be able to command a much better valuation, you know, if, if you're sort of in, the, in that discussion. Um, so I've always kind of taken just enough money. Well, early on, I took just enough money to get a finished product done, and to be able to, you know, with my type of business, to get to attend a few trade shows, um, and uh, you know, sign up, you know, 25, you know, customers, for example. Um, and then once we've kind of got to that stage and we had some track record, we could show that, hey, we have sales, people are buying, they're reordering. Um, that's a very powerful statement because then you can project and say, hey, if it's performing like this on, at, at this small scale, imagine if it's in a Home Depot or if it's in a, in a larger scale, you know, if, if the behaviors continue, then, you know, the numbers, you know, start to blow up. Um, <clears throat> so it's it's sort of just take enough money to get you to you know delay it as much as possible. If you can build it without <coughs> taking money, try to get it as far as possible because it makes it more valuable. The business more valuable when you have that discussion, and then just take enough to kind of get you to that next hurdle. You know, and, and when you're raising money, always build in a little bit of a cushion because s sometimes you think it's going to take you six months. It, it takes you know a year. And you, know, you may have some false starts along the way. So always have a cushion built in. Okay. Right. I'm going to push you a little bit more. Um, when you, so along these lines, what make, at what point did you decide that you needed to bring in the second partner? And what were their responsibilities? And you also mentioned um, kind of service investments. So okay. I guess working with people. But what, what did you give them in return? Yeah, so the second part, the both second partners are actually, it was service-related relate, type deals. So one was, um, for us, uh, pat, you know, covering the, the patents, you know, all of, we're patenting our products both in the U.S. and worldwide, and that gets really, really expensive really, really quick. And so, um, you know, I negotiated, you know, with, with the, uh, the uh, law firm that's handling our IP, uh, where we had the option, the deal we struck was we had the option to either pay um, cash at a certain date when we hit a certain sales figure or we raise a certain amount of money, or um, you know we could offer equity. And um, it, I, I think they did, you know, they did that deal. I think because I think they believed in me. They also believed in in sort of the. The, the, the product and, and sort of what, you know, the vision of the company. Um, and, um, and so um, I think, and we had had a history of working, they, they had sort of seen, 
the company from very early on. So they've, they've seen the progression of the company. So I think they warmed up to the idea and they, you know, they were willing to do that deal. The other, um, the other investor was, um, you know, we uh, leased uh, office space. And so we just worked out a deal where, you know, rather than pay cash, it, it's, it's not a lot of money, but, um, you know, we, we wanted to conserve funds as much as possible. And so um, we offered equity in exchange for, you know, leasing the office space. Um, the, the space we're in is sort of like an incubator. There's like three businesses there. And, you know, I, that was a deal that I, I felt comfortable. You know, we had the cash that we could pay cash, but I felt more comfortable, you know, um, offering equity because I felt like I got a lot more value out of that relationship um, than just the office space. That, you know, that invest is like a mentor uh, to me as well. So, so let me take a couple more. Leah? Um, I had a question in terms of managing your investments. I mean, you mentioned 25 people. 30. 30. Um, in terms of the time, how do you keep them updated? What kind of information flow yes. do you give them? Do you have any advice on that? So I have a pretty religious about monthly um, formal updates that are akin to what you would put in a board book in terms of updates, in terms of mar sales, marketing, team, strategy, financing, etc. cetera. Um, and then of course, to all full financials, balance sheet and profit and loss statement and performance formas as they've been adjusted. Um, that's quarterly. And then we do an annual team retreat that they're invited to come to at their expense, but it's in Napa, so it's all, since it's wine after all, that there's, that, there's that sizzle. Uh, and then two of the largest investors who've put in over half a million are actually on the board of directors now. And so they have, they are, and they're great. One of them is particularly phenomenal and has been the CEO, serial entrepreneur and serial angel investor and is just awesome. So they're on the board, so we have monthly board calls and quarterly board meetings. But I, I've just taken a very formal approach. The downside of that, and the downside of an investor, and most passive, most are passive. The downside is even though there are a couple you know, $50,000 guys in there who are great people, when they do call and say, hey, listen, I'm going to this UN Foundation event tonight at Stanford, can you come and you want to grab coffee beforehand? I obviously have to say yes, and I'm always happy to, but as Jessica articulated, it's always time to away from selling or managing or cross-cutting, but, and that's frustrating. And so it's not that they're not one of the people, bless you. It's that it's just, you know, it's time intensive, but it's not time intensive in terms of ongoing communication if you I think if you keep it fairly professional and formal and I, and I do feel that you know this is an obvious thing but I don't think it's there's a fear I, mean, I think if things ever go sour with your investor base I would presume that you would there'd be a fear factor of disclosing bad information I have kept I've been very very upfront about and been very very honest where I want to be very upbeat and excited and engaged and optimistic and clear about what the vision is for this company but I've never been you know, I've never disclosed or thrown under the rar under the carpet some major challenges. I mean, not nitty gritty in the weed stuff, but some ma bigger strategic things. And so, I think if you call those out in advance of them becoming issues, or as you're dealing with them, to in, in letters or when you see someone socially, if you're just honest, right? I mean, it's sort of basic, but if you're just upfront, that that instills confidence. I think there are actually cases taught about that. But just being really being up being up front with your, with your investor base on whatever frequency feels right is what endears their trust more than anything else. Yeah. No nasty surprises. No, you want to early and often. Uh, and, and two last, the last question. It, it, it's something that we've talked about. Obviously, it's the nature of the business, right? You've got to have the money. And so wherever you end up getting it, you know, it sounds like maybe even Melissa with you, a lot of investors, that's a big thing to manage. Is there such a thing or can there be such a thing as kind of a right uh, upfront right to buy out the investors at a predetermined rate or a predetermined time? Can you set that up that if I end up giving you your capital at 20% interest after a year or two years, is that something that can be worked in? We, I had a smaller earlier investor um, and as soon as we could, you know, I, I mean, I just personally enjoy a really small cap table yeah. because yeah. of, you know, yeah, it's just cleaner, easier, not communicating, and we feel like if you're not, and it just sort of, if you're not, we have a very, everyone who's involved in the business is actively involved in creating value for it, and so I have bought out a, okay. a smaller investor. Um, the other thing to think about in having people invest is if you're getting smart money, you want to make sure they have enough, and I often think that entrepreneurs make, spend way too much time thinking about valuation and dilution. Instead of, you know, you're worried about having ultimately 
50, 60, 30, 40 percent of what, it doesn't matter. If it's big, it's big enough. And I think you just have to focus on who are you going to bring in to make it big and make it worthwhile. I, I don't want to own 80 percent of something small. I'd much rather own 30, 40 percent of something very, very large. So control can be done in many other, in, in other ways too. So I'm not saying you want to take yourself down to like 5 percent and ha have no controls, but there's there's an operating agreement. There's a board structure. There's classic units. And I think you want to make sure that you, in most investors, it's not going to register on their radar. They don't care if they don't, it, and especially most talented, savvy people who have the money to invest, unless they're a significant enough owner, they're not going to spend their time and energy on the business. So I think in that sense, you can take too little and you're wasting your time. Then they become a communication you know, hassle rather than an active driver and contributor in the business. So, you know, that's just a, just another and then thought the, on that. And then the other thing is once you're already into the fundraising process, I absolutely have had existing say, um, you know, in one particular, do more of a venture debt type of term sheet saying we've got X in the company, we'll provide another, now that I've, now that we see this inflection point, we'll provide another, you know, Y. Um, but we don't want to structure as equity. We don't want to dilute you. We don't, you know, we're ha let's structure it as debt because we're looking at cash flows. We think you'll be able to pay off in X period of time. And, you know, we'll see. Maybe we'll go that road. Maybe this is recent. So we'll, maybe we will, maybe we won't. But, um, I mean, yeah, it's, I, I, you want people in the table who are there to help you. And the classic challenge of bootstrapping, I mean, the classic trade off of bootstrapping, and this is, I, you know, I think when you're talking about widget companies and you get real clear, as Andre obviously has done an exemplary job of getting real clear on the unit economics, that's good. When you're building technology businesses, it's technology, I mean, it's, it, you, ironically, it's still expensive to build, it's labor intensive to build, you need many engineers working on it. And, when you, and what I've found being bootstrapped in the technology business is an interest, you know, we've, we've fought through it, but it's been an interesting struggle because it, it's a naturally creative process. It evolves. You want to do other things. There are false starts. There are also things that start going well, and you want to pour more cash into them, and you don't have it. So I think that I, I, I probably wouldn't bootstrap a technology business again. I, I bootstrap. I absolutely bootstrap again, but I wouldn't bootstrap a technology business. Just as a final comment, because you've done several ventures. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that can, you know, the question, can you do X with your investors? I mean, generally speaking, the answer is yes. There's a way to get you know, any of that done. I do think that, um, I, you know, part of what you um, I are buying into when you have investors at all, really whether it's friends and family, angel investors, you know, uh, all the way out up to, you know, traditional venture or corporate um, types of investors is um, you, you do need to think about how much of your own time is it going to take to manage those relationships and 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 be very cognizant of it and structure it. Um, people have talked about it here, but structure those expectations up front. Those should be part of the discussions as people put money in and being very organized about it and having a system for it is important because um, I think you know you're probably all here and we're all here because we're entrepreneurs. We love the product. We love building the business. And generally speaking, you know. Having investors along for the ride is a great thing if they're adding value to the company outside of the money. But the amount of money they're putting in and the money itself is, is just a means to an end. Um, their experience, their connections, how smart they are, their ability to roll up their sleeves, introduce you to people, do all the things that you really need is what really is great about having other people on the bus with you, you know, getting to where you need to go. So um, I, you know, I think my, exp my experience is just be aware that that's part of it. Be very organized, and you know, make sure that the investors that you're bringing in aren't going to, you know, take you on a ride that is heading in, in a direction opposite from where you really want to be taking business. Just, just as a summary point, I mean, although the topic is bootstrapping and friends and family, what what you see is just like insights into four really good entrepreneurs, and and hopefully that over the two days you'll get in terms of. The more you can get exposure and pick up and see how diverse people's perspectives are and their resilience, I think the more you, you can sort of build your own industrial strength in terms of setting up companies. So that's part of the object is not to put, put stuff in the boxes, but actually to make actually to raise your aspirations and make them realistic as, aspirations. I think we've got four really good 
role models on that to do that. So thanks very much.